Right now we're on to what I think sounds a fascinating discussion. It's called Changing Mindsets, Changing Lives. Uh, it's all about getting ahead of problems, I suppose, really, and uh, hopefully reducing the amount of time you spend on them as a consequence. It's at least uh, arguable that uh, looking at uh, the social background and perhaps the educational standards of certain groups, you can identify uh, the sort of issues that might uh, crop up uh, in later years and cause you problems. So, what sort of interventions are acceptable? Uh, what sort of interventions actually work? And does the service really have the time uh, and indeed in these uh, circumstances the wherewithal uh, to do uh, all of this? That's what I want you to think about as we listen to three speakers. We've got uh, Donna Malloy, who's from the Early Intervention uh, Foundation. I'm sure she'll explain exactly what uh, all that what that represents. We've got Karen McCluskey, from, who's director of the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit. Unfortunately, Stuart Noble, uh, Chief Superintendent from Lancashire, can't be with us. He is ill, but uh, Steve Hodgkins, also from the Lancashire Force, Sergeant Steve Hodgkins, uh, will cover that ground for us as well. So would you give all three of them a warm welcome? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to have been asked um, to speak this afternoon to tell you about the work of my organisation, the Early Intervention Foundation, in supporting the role of the police in early intervention. Um, I probably should start by explaining what we mean by the term early intervention. I think it's fair to say it's not a phrase that has a consistent understanding or definition. We get asked a lot, is it just about early years, is it the same as early help, and so on and so forth. For us in the Early Intervention Foundation, what we mean is targeted activity to support children and families in situations where there are early signs of problems to prevent those problems worsening. And it's very much not just about early years. We're interested in the whole range from conception right through to the transition to adulthood. We know that timely and effective intervention throughout childhood and adolescence can make an enormous impact in terms of children's outcomes. Um, there's a wealth of evidence now about the impact this can have on outcomes and savings to the public purse. Um, obviously this covers a broad range of activity, so we're talking here about interventions to support parenting, things like youth work and mentoring, more intensive whole family interventions like we're seeing in many areas being developed under the Troubled Families Programme, and also things like therapeutic um, interventions. I think it's fair to say that whilst the case for early intervention is now fairly well made, understood and accepted, this is still not actually what happens um, in practice. We did some financial estimates back in February where we tried to calculate the annual cost in England of public agency spending on late intervention. Um, we think it's an underestimate but we came up with the figure of 17 billion. That's, that's in one single year. Um, there are no reliable estimates about how much we actually spend on early intervention, but lots of unreliable ones that suggest it's actually a whole lot less. And we also know that many of the services out there that provide early intervention are, in fa are facing increasing financial pressure and closure given the financial climate um, in many local areas at the moment. Um, my organisation, the Early Intervention Foundation, was established and um, were very new just back in 2013 as a result of the work that Graham Allen MP, the MP for Nottingham North, um, did back in 2011 when he was asked by Ian Duncan Smith under the previous coalition government to, to do a review looking at the impact early intervention could have and make recommendations for government as to how they could take this agenda forward. Graham's central recommendation was about the need for an independent body to advise local commissioners and decision makers about how to use the evidence to inform local policy and practice. Um, and so we've been going for about two years now. Um, we're an independent charity and a What Works centre. So we sit alongside um, fairly heavyweight organisations like the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, the College of Policing and the Educational Endowment Foundation. Um, but a much smaller 
um, I'm afraid. And we have two key functions, analysis of the evidence, so bring together the best evidence about what works in terms of effective early intervention, because not all early intervention is actually effective, and also advice. We're very keen in using the evidence to inform the decisions that people are making in a range of local contexts. Um, Graham was always very clear, wasn't interested in an academic, academic organisation that was just producing evidence for its own sake. And so we have a small team of advisors who are out there in councils and working with a range of local partners, helping them use this evidence. And we've worked for the last two years closely with, with 20 places, which are mainly local authority-led partners, but we also have two police and crime commissioner-led areas, which are Lancashire and Staffordshire. And really want in the rest of this session to tell you a little bit more about our work supporting police forces. A key theme in many areas was how to create a culture in which early intervention, early help, early action, whatever you want to call it, is seen as something that's actually everyone's business and not just something that the early intervention or family support team in an area is responsible for. Um, now more than ever, given the pressures facing public services, we need to use the full reach of public services to support this really crucial agenda. And that's about equipping key frontline workforces so that the first person who walks in the door of a family home or has contact with a child or a young person can spot risk, can identify and provide support that might be needed where that's feasible or can access more specialist help where that's needed. So we started to think about how we could support some of the wider bits of the public sector that are not the usual suspects in relation to early intervention. And so started with the police and the screenshot here is of our guide for frontline police and PCSOs which we published back in February this year and is available um, on our website. Could I just have a show of hands for those who are actually aware of this work? Okay, that's not bad, thank you. Still trying to judge how far we're seen as an organisation that's of relevance to police forces. This work has generated lots of interest from forces, many of whom, as you all know, are asking questions about how we can move more upstream from, re re sorry, from reacting to problems to preventing them. I think there's widespread recognition now, certainly from everyone we talk to, that crime prevention is not about locks and security lights, but is about responding to vulnerability in local communities and issues such as mental health, safeguarding, antisocial behaviour, and so on and so forth. Um, the pie chart on the slide here is from research that Lancashire Constabulary did where they mapped over a 12-month period calls for service and what the issues were at the heart of those um, calls for police time. What they found was that 48% of those calls for service related to issues which you could classify as early action which required a response beyond a traditional police response to those sorts of circumstances. Um, people have been telling us again and again that the police know who the families are in local communities who will struggle to provide a positive environment for their children. Um, and you'll all know this police data is absolutely vital in supporting other agencies locally to think about how they target services. Um, another example from Lancashire, 64% of prolific offenders are from households with a domestic violence marker. Um, it's quite likely many of those households will have young children or people who are about to become parents and a clear case there for thinking about how we support um, those families so that intergenerational patterns of crime, offending, antisocial behaviour, child abuse and so on are not repeated. Um, and we know that this sort of data is shared in different types of activity if you look at things like the multi-agency safeguarding hubs or work on troubled families but all too often this doesn't happen more widely and is more isolated examples. One of the things we heard really clearly in the work we did with police forces for the guide that I've mentioned was that the police don't need to be persuaded about the importance of early intervention. In fact, um, they are some of the strongest advocates for this agenda. They see day in, day out, out the need for early intervention. And indeed, some officers that we spoke to were pretty worn down by endless team problems that they felt unable to respond to or get partners to respond to. Yet despite all of this, um, the police role 
turn this agenda is not straightforward. As you'll all know, Forces' budgets are reducing. There's lots of questions locally about whose job this actually is. And what we heard was that the command and control culture in many forces doesn't incentivise or often recognise this sort of activity. And many operational police are trying to deliver on this sort of gender, sometimes at odds with the way that they're actually being pulled within their individual forces. Yet despite all of this, some forces are really innovating and asking fundamental questions about how we arrange public services and resources best in order to protect the most vulnerable. And for me to return back, refer back to the title of this session, this is the sort of change of mindset that can actually change lives. And at EIF, we're working to support some of these forces who are innovating and really interested in capturing what people are doing and critically testing what sort of difference it can make. And there are a few examples on the slides here of some of the areas in which we're seeing people innovating. Police reviewing key types of in incidents in which police are involved but where they think they're not responding effectively and developing new ways of working with other agencies and partners locally to respond to those sorts of incidents. One example from Blackpool, Blackpool relates to domestic violence related call-outs which are classed as low risk and so there's no prosecution or further police action but where the police have now persuaded the local council to allocate a family support worker to those households to, to respond to the various issues that are likely to be there. Sounds obvious, but this is the sort of thing that isn't happening uniformly. Another area is radical service integration. Some areas are redesigning neighbourhood police teams to create single early action or early intervention teams in local high demand neighbourhoods, which include all of the public sector agencies that are needed to respond to the vulnerabilities in that particular place. Um, other examples, some brilliant examples of forces innovating about how to develop new relationships with communities and build capacity in communities to actually tackle and respond to some of their own problems without actually having to need to involve public services. And finally, on tracking impact and outcomes, um, for us as the Early Intervention Foundation and a What Works Centre, um, we have to emphasise this. There are lots of innovation in early intervention generally where great claims are made about impact, but things tend not to be very well tested. Um, and so our view is that it's absolutely crucial that we really robustly test some of these models and things that people are trying in order to establish once and for all what sort of difference actually can be made. Um, just moving to the end now, one of the things I just wanted to mention before I finish um, and that we've been keen to do is make sure we share the thinking on this agenda so that 43 forces aren't working it out independently. So in July we launched what we're calling our Early Intervention Academy for Police Leaders. Um, the idea is that we'll bring together those from different forces who are at the forefront of this agenda and who are innovating, expose them to each other and national experts in order to help them develop, develop practical plans and proposals to take this agenda even further back in their particular forces and with partners. Um, we asked for nominations at chief inspector or superintendent rank um, and have been absolutely overwhelmed. We've been enormously oversubscribed. We had 20 places initially and over 65 applications and so have now extended it to um, 25 places. The successful applicants are being notified today and there's a press notice on our website if any of you um, have an interest in this. But I've been asked by colleagues to say particular congratulations to Greater Manchester Police, West Midlands Police, Avon and Somerset and North Wales, all of whom have um, had accepted more than one delegate for the Early Intervention Academy. And finally, just in case I've failed to convince any of you about the importance of the police role in early intervention, I thought I'd give the last word to Irene, um, at least virtually. Um, you'll all know Irene has um, written and spoken about the importance of early intervention on many occasions, is a very persuasive advocate for this, and has made clear that whilst at a time of contracting budgets, um, many would say the police cannot afford to take on early intervention, her view 
fact is that the police cannot afford not to. That's everything I wanted to say. I'll just put that up. That's where you can find um, more information or get in touch with us if people want to know more. Thank you. Well, Larry, the hairstyle may have changed, but the ideals and the drive hasn't. You're still there fighting for what you believe in, quite right too. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Donna. Uh, Karen McCluskey is our next uh, speaker. Karen, to remind you, is Director of the Scottish Finance Reduction Unit. Karen. It's dead nice that you still invite Scots down here. I'd like to tell you that Niven and my Scottish colleagues could translate for me, but you must have spoken to them earlier. So, I have to speak to you a little bit about prevention and about some of the work that we're doing. Can I just say, despite all the controversy about policing, we're at a 41-year low for crime in Scotland. And we were talking about it this morning. Our violence was reduced. I work with some spectacular people in Scotland, spectacular police officers who absolutely are committed. So see as I go forward, because we've still got some huge challenges. Can you understand that I still think policing is a great profession and that we can do some extraordinary things when we uh, put our minds to it? So I am the metaphorical equivalent of a quick rub down with a guardian. So I'm about to talk to you a wee bit about prevention, about dealing with ambiguity. So. I think sometimes when we consider the, the, the society that we live in, we can become overwhelmed. When we read about some of the issues that we have around child abuse, um, some of the really complex communities, financial systems, ecosystems collapsing, we can become overwhelmed. My recent response to this has been to turn off Radio 4 and stop yelling at it, because maybe turn over to Radio 1, but that seems a bit pointless. Everybody yells at Radio 1. Because we face some really wicked problems complex, complicated, and we are not going to get to the stage that we say that it's fixed. And there's a little bit around, we need to dry our eyes and think differently about how we challenge some, how we tackle some of these things going forward. Because the response has generally been to reorganise. Oh, I've gone on one too far. Has been to reorganise internally to tackle the challenge. Usually with the same people, retrain the professionals to cope with another manifestation of hopelessness with a weary air of those who fought the same ill on numerous occasions only to have it proliferate and form resistance. I quite like to put Peter Fahey up here only because I like his face. He does stern really well, doesn't he? <laughs> right, I just, and it was really interesting. I saw this thing in The Guardian. It was, it was last year when he was asking about medical records. And of course, it was reported really poorly. You know, He wanted access to people's medical <laughs> records. But actually, Peter was thinking about outcome. He was thinking about cops who are turning up at people's doors without any idea of whether somebody's got dementia, whether they've got a whole range of challenges because he wanted to deal with things better. He actually was very forward thinking. It's perhaps a shame that our media didn't report it in the way that perhaps he should have done. So in Scotland, we're a bit of a paradigm shift. I've only got 15 minutes, so somebody's going to have to taser me off. So in Scotland, we had a bit of a paradigm shift about 11 years ago. I had a very enlightened chief constable. Um, who, when we said, you know something, Chief, despite the best efforts of policing over the past 30 years, we have made hee-haw difference to violence. We haven't prevented it. The Pelian principle, the absence of crime and disorder, for me, is the best litmus test of great policing, prevention. And we seem to have forgotten that over the last while, haven't we? All our key performance indicators are about things that we can measure. And it's not been very enlightened. And I was incredibly lucky that he said, do you have a map? And I said, no. And he said, but we have a compass. We know where we're going. I can still shut my eyes and understand what a safer Scotland looks like. Where kids grow up in houses where they don't have to experience violence. Where young men don't think their only opportunity and is to join a gang. Because they don't lack any information about death or prison. They already know that. Their families are littered with it. So I can still imagine. So we decided we would turn violence not into a criminal justice solution because the jails were full, we'd done that, we were really quite good at it. We'd turn it into a disease. And we'd talk about how people were infected, just like measles. So we spoke about transmission, what worked to prevent transmission, and then how you scaled it up. Scotland is the only country where violence is a stated public health issue, just like measles, just like TB, 
And it has allowed us to think about a whole range of different things. It's allowed us to talk about primary prevention, about children, about secondary prevention, targeting those at risk in our schools, the role of campus cops who are spectacular. And tertiary prevention, targeting victims and offenders. The last speaker, the speaker before last, sorry, I've forgotten whose name was, and the police superintendent, talked about prevention and about some of the things that we did in policing. Our campus cops and their own policing are absolutely spectacular. And indeed, so, sorry, I'm looking at the time now, I'm really distracted. So we decided we'd do this. We started to look at primary prevention. We took the World Health Organization. We started to look at safe and stable relationships, early years, domestic abuse. If you think about how violence is, is transmitted, developing life and social skills, compassion, empathy, decision making. These are all the skills that you guys have, and ladies. They help you get through life without bumping into alcohol or drugs or violence. Challenging cultural and social norms that support violence. When I first went to the prison service and I said to someone very senior, I want to stop violence, I want, we're going to set up a violence reduction unit. He said, it's too big, don't bother. And he gave me a cup of tea and I never went back to see him. Because you get a number of options, and I say this all the time, you can lead, you can follow, or you can get out of the way. Because if you really want to change things, and he was in a place that all he could see, it was like the status quo. That sometimes it's like boiling a frog, isn't it? You change it one degree at a time and eventually the frog's dead. He'd just become used to the operating framework that he was, he was in. And he couldn't think of anything else. It's not his fault. But I think we need to look a bit higher at the horizon. Reducing access to lethal means, and that is what we do. And I'm so pleased in Scotland we have, I think our knife carrying is probably the lowest it's ever been. Reducing availability and harmful use of alcohol. That's it. Because I'm looking at a population. I'm doing that normal distribution curve. I'm trying to move as much of the population that way into non-offending. In early years, I'm not going to repeat what they've said there. It's as close as it gets to being magic without being magic. You follow your parents. We talked earlier about teachers, what teachers do. Teachers can only teach what parents provide. Parenting is where it's at. And we need to change. Scotland um, transferred a huge amount of money, many millions of pounds to support parenting throughout Scotland because we realised it was at the very foundation of changing the outcome for some of the most deprived kids in Scotland. And we're not there yet. We have to fix this whilst it's moving. But I hope in 10, 15 years' time that our crime will be lower still because we're investing now. And if you want any evidence base of it, you can have a look at James Heckman's paper. James Heckman, who was a Nobel laureate economist, said for every pound that you invested, not three, you would have to invest about 16, 17 pounds at the age of 15 or 16 to get the same effect. The evidence base is there. It's our ability to deliver it that's the real challenge. And to target those who are at risk. I think we've done a whole range of things in our, in our secondary schools and supported teachers to equip kids with the ability to get through life. When I speak to um, some of the authors of the report who wrote about Rotherham and some of the child sexual abuse, they said that while some of the, um, some of the people in authority didn't know about it, you know who really knew about it was the other kids. We teach bystander in every single school in Scotland, or at least we will be in every school in Scotland by the next two years, where every child is equipped with the skills to be able to highlight and challenge behaviour and know when to ask for help so that, you know, that no one's safe until everybody's safe, so they all have a range of skills so that they can intervene when their colleagues are seeing something online to be able to change the outcomes and tertiary prevention. These are, my, um, these are probably the guys that you're arresting on a frequent basis. We jail 15,000 people a year in Scotland. We have conversations about building criminal justice capacity for 15 years' time. Can I tell you, see if we're doing that, that's an admission that we're going to fail the five-year-olds who are in primary one today. And frankly, that is less than aspirational. The evidence base is that for these guys and ladies, that their kids will be 70% more likely to end up in jail themselves. Of the 30 there, they had 147 children between them. I need to change their outcomes. And we've been working, I know that Jobs, Friends and Houses is going to be talking about this later on, so I'm not going to, you know, we work 
hugely to try and encourage employers to take on 3% of the working population from an offending background because I need the kids to see their dads and their mums going out to work to be part of the wealth creation of Scotland because that really is prevention. I had a little bit of a thought experiment without any methodology or results a couple of weeks ago when I was, I was doing the fringe and I did a two-minute manifesto. And my two-minute manifesto was, I wonder if the sheriffs or the judges could sentence people to employment. You know that way, we know it works. But there has to be a punishment part of the, the sentence. But could you then address your alcohol or your violence or your domestic abuse and a whole range of things? And then could we then think about how we get you into a job? Because we know that the best way to stop a gun or a gang or a knife is a job. And it has a better thing. And can I tell you, I don't always like the people that I'm working with. I don't love them, but I really like their kids. And I need their kids to have a different outcome, or you and all will be arresting them in 15 years' time. So I'm quite content with the Daily Mail not liking me. You know? That when they phone me up and they say, why are you working with these bad boys? And I'll say, what's your, what's your take this week? Is it welfare scroungers, or you don't want me getting those bad boys' jobs because it's one or the other? And, you know, and keep them, welfare scroungers. I say, well, I'm trying to change the outcome for the most disenfranchised, because these guys are offenders one week, victims the next. You'd like them all to be in two separate groups, but they're not, they're the same. So we need to change the way that we do things. So here's my disciplines. It's really hard saying this because obviously the Scots are complete Calvinists. We think that everything, we're all doomed and that, you know, it's all going to go horribly wrong. So I really have to try and hard to fight the Calvinism. I know that in the police you are as well. Come on, I've worked in loads of different forces. So you need to find the positive architects in life. There are loads of people that will tell you that will never work, that you can never do it. But I fundamentally, I'm imbued with that sense. I think there's a hope. I absolutely think that we can do it. John Cleese said, it's not the despair, I can take the despair, it's the hope I can't bear. I could bear some hope. So you need to find the positive architects, and particularly in partnership. It's so hackneyed. I always think a partnership's like a good marriage. You need to have deep, long conversations. You need to understand what makes other people feel valued. And you need to work out what it is the outcome. Can you all shut your eyes and think, articulate what success looks like to you? Because I don't think we take enough time to do that. So education thinks it's just about, it's about exam criteria. Social work think it's just about no seeing their clients again, and the police think it's about detections. I think we need to have a more, a better conversation about what the outcome's going forward, and innovate. Somebody mentioned innovate earlier. Innovate, always think you're being innovative when you can scare the hell out of people, and I recommend you do that on at least a monthly basis. But I also think demonstration is the highest form of proof. I love it when people say to me, that will never work. You could never do that. I think sometimes you just need to challenge people. Show them you can do it and challenge others to do it. When we're talking about what happens in different forces, I bet you in Lancashire they say that, well, that's happening in Greater Manchester Police. That would never work here. We used to do that in Scotland when we had eight forces. If it happened in Inverness, it would never work in Glasgow. We need to go over ourselves. We need that quick rub down with the Guardian and start to think about the outcomes for the people that we serve, because I'm a great believer in public service. I try and think about the people that we actually serve and not just the organisational outcomes. This was, a, this was from the, the Telegraph last year. I don't know if anybody saw it. It was about a feral pig in Australia that dr drank 18 cans of beer, fought a cow, and then passed out drunk under a tree. Other than the cow, that's what happens in Scotland. <laughs> and... I've been working, I'm fondly known within my family as a temperance society because I sit on minimum unit pricing for Scotland. That's real innovation. That's that population. About raising the price of alcohol because alcohol is at the heart of so many of the challenges that we have in Scotland. And I fundamentally think that by changing something at a national level and moving the population that way into less drinking is a good thing. But oh my goodness, are the people out to get us? There's a whole range. We had the judgment from the European Court to Justice the other day, they are saying that we had to prove that nothing else could work. Well, I'm not really sure that other things, nothing else will work. I think that we need to address the fact that some alcohol and vodka is cheaper than water. That's not right. That's not right in 21st century Scotland. I'm sure it's not right in 21st century England either, although you guys drink less than us, so we've got more of a problem. So you need to innovate. We've got a sunset clause in this, so that if it doesn't work, then we, we remove it. But can I tell you, at least we will have tried. We will have tried to prevent, because we are regularly have 21 and 22-year-olds who die of liver cirrhosis in our alcohol units. 
you know? Young kids who are drinking at the age of 13 or 14 and drinking litres and litres of cider a day. I'm not sure that anybody would really like that and the associated problems it has. And I'd like to say that absence of evidence is no evidence of absence. I wonder how many of you in this room have key performance indicators that measure prevention. I bet you haven't, you know, because it's really difficult. Sometimes, as leaders, you just need to have an understanding that you're going in the right direction, that you have a real good community network, that you're speaking to people and think, you know, we're doing the right thing here. That when you're supporting early years and teachers, that's not because you're not doing your job and locking up criminals because you have to do that as well. And leadership. I think it's really interesting when I'm speaking to superintendents, I, I teach on the command courses I was berating someone earlier about. And leadership's not about you. It's not about you. I know that you're already good. You've made it to superintendent level. Your job is to reach down and under and pull those who are less able along with you. And that's community, that's your own staff, and that's your organisation. It's about having that muscle memory that you, rec you, you remember why you joined the service. You remember why you're doing it. And it's not just about figures. It's about doing the right thing. You need to know who you are, why it matters, and why you do it. And I suppose for a country, I, uh, I did do a bit of a speech a couple of years ago, which was about Scotland. And I called it, I want to be a bit more like Finland, which was a bit difficult because at the time, Mr. Salmon just wanted to be really like Scotland. And I spoke about Finland because when you talk about outcomes, when Finland had antisocial behaviour and crime problems, they didn't develop more antisocial behaviour orders or criminal legislation to deal with it. They fundamentally changed their society. They taxed people more. And then what they developed was pedagogues, who are a mixture of social work and health and nurses, etc. And they go in every family and support every child until the age of eight, every child. And here's the thing, these pedagogues 50% of them are men because they're paid well and really respected. And then you don't actually go to school until you're eight, which struck fear into my heart because I was desperate to get rid of my kid at five. <laughs> and in Finnish society, there are no educational outcomes, you know. Their only outcomes is to turn out the best equipped kids to meet the needs of the nation. So that's communication, problem solving, teamwork, and all the skills that help you be a great human being. And then they test them at 14, and guess what? They actually turn out the best educated kids in the world. And see, normally when I'm speaking to audiences, I'll say to them, if I told you, for some of the kids and the families that you're dealing with just now, if I told you we could turn around some of the, the outcomes for these children, would you pay more tax? I would. I would. And I have to say that 90% of the people that I speak to say yes as well. The problem is, the next thing they say is, ah, oh, but I don't trust the politicians. Completely different question. But this is what the Finnish say. When I was asking the Finnish ministers how they managed to change the country, they said you need this. Political will, an attitudinal and ideological readiness to bring down crime. You know, none of this real politic. We just deal with what's in front of us. A successful plan needs all the key actors. There is only one government cake. Whatever slice you get of it, there is only one government cake. Maybe we need to think about outcomes and participatory budgeting to see who can have the greatest effect. Information and education, we need to change society's view about what works on the nature and causes of crime. Because the old hang by the neck until dead hasn't worked either. Because had that worked, America would have no crime because they jail three million a year. That experiment's not working. And you need to have the public opinion and the role of the media. When I'm speaking to the command course and I'm speaking to the superintendents at Warwick, I usually say to them, you need to be better at speaking to the media. You need to form a relationship because they will reach more people than you will ever reach. And we need to engage them in getting out a more balanced view. I'm not looking for a cheerleader. If I get it wrong, I've got a whole lecture I do in failure. If I get it wrong, they can crucify me and they have on occasion. I've got skin as thick as a rhino, but at least I've tried. And you need constructive crime prevention alternatives, which is why I'm trying. I wonder if we could sentence people to employment. I have to say, the sheriffs aren't overly keen on that at the moment. But I'll get them there. I'm a bit like a, you know, I'm sort of I'm like a dog with a burst ball. I feel that if I, if I keep on going back to them enough, they'll, they'll capitulate eventually. But I know there's loads of people that don't want us to succeed. 
There's loads of people that would just think, ah, don't bother. They just want you to do the traditional stuff. Well, this is 2015. If we are to have changed in 2025, I know loads of you will have retired by then. I might still be here. I think I have to work till I'm 67. We need to forget them. You need to find your positive architects and ignore those who would rather things didn't change, who've got a vested interest in keeping things like they are. We have a whole poverty industry, which is almost obsessed with their own jobs and keeping people down. So thank you very much indeed. I think I'm just on time. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. Uh, Steve, if you'd like to come to the platform. Sergeant Steve Hodgkins uh, from the uh, Lancashire Constabulary will wind up our uh, speeches and then uh, hopefully some time for questions at the end. Is that a uh, subtle hint, John, to make sure I finish on time then? Uh, that's a subtle way of saying it, yes. Okay, um, I'm Steve Hodgkins. I'm uh, all the sergeant, but my other hat that I wear, the, the main hat I wear now, is I'm a CEO of Jobs, Friends and Houses, which is a community interest company. So, and it taught the changing mindsets, changing lives. And so, what I wanted to try and do to begin with was talk about the mindsets had to change to actually get the social enterprise established. And the first people's mindset had to change was the police, my senior officers, to support it. And then I had to try move on to the statutory partners, still haven't quite got there yet, some of the Blackpool Council, not really very supportive. Then was the actual prolific offenders that I deal with and support, and then finally the communities. And those are the sort of mindsets, and we're, we're, we're working through, and it's, well, I hope you'll see as we go that it is working. Community interest company, social enterprise, it's a not-for-profit, but we're a business, we're not a charity, we're not a service, we're there to make money. The money we make goes back in to support more people. So my wages are covered by the constabulary, Lancashire, my board of directors, all they give their time and expertise for free. But we're, we're a business and I think it's quite important because that is a key part of the people that we support and the difference we make to their lives is they are, it matters to them. It's not a charity, it's not uh, a service, it's a business, and we have to make money to support and sustain ourselves. So I'm on a full-time secondment, because I saw a few faces, police officers, so I'm a full-time secondment to, to run this business. And our, what we do, our mission, is to support and sustain recovery. And the way I, I look at it is, I've come across a lot of people in my career who are in addiction, and it, we move them from addiction to recovery. And we keep them and we sustain them in the recovery. And there's four things that we do. But some of the, yeah. Uh, currently, we're supporting 41 prolific ex-offenders. We've got a 0% re-offending rate and a 0% relapse rate. So, yeah, we've been going just over a year. But hopefully, that's probably why I'm stood here, because of those figures. Um, but that's why it's working. Um, and I, I will tell you some stories of the prolific offenders. I, I think I, 15 minutes doesn't really give me time to go into the details. So all I can give you really is the sort of the, the theory, the concept, the model. And then I'll tell you some stories about the people that we are helping so you know that these are prolific ex-offenders, not, uh, not, not prolific. How do we do it? It's four key things. So our model, four parts of our model, very much what uh, Karen was talking about. Meaningful employment, um, so we create jobs, and we do that by predominantly being a building company. Um, so it's construction related, it's skilled employment. Uh, I went to a, an opening of a, a recovery unit in, uh, in Manchester a few months ago, and it had two prisoners just come out of strange ways, and they're making cups of tea, and it was, it was, everybody was high-fiving each other, that isn't this great? And actually, for me, yeah, that's, that was, but this is meaningful. This is about sustaining them in 20, 30 years with a, with a career, with actually something that they want to come to work for. So it's skilled employment, plumber, plastering, joinery, carpentry, uh, bricklaying, all that skilled work. And obviously, if any of you have needed any work done on your house recently, you'll know that there is a, a lack of that type of skilled uh, workforce in the country. We pay the living wage, we pay £7.85 an hour. So for somebody who, who starts with us as an adult apprentice, it works at about £15,500 a year. So we do, yeah, that's really important for us to actually make that part of the offer that we create for our team. 
The second bit, the friends bit, inspirational peer friendship. And this is, um, this is really powerful. This is a bit where the people have been sh sharing the landings at prison. They've been sharing needles. Uh, and they, they, well, if he's done it, if she's done it, then I can do it. And that friendship bit of actually learning from each other and, and, and helping and supporting each other is, is another key aspect, key element of how we do it. Third bit, stable accommodation. It's about, oh, it must have been 18 months ago now, I, I picked up a prisoner from uh, Preston Prison, I was bringing him out, He'd, uh, he was uh, one of our prolific uh, offenders, and he was coming back to Blackpool, finished his sentence, picked him up on the gate, and he was coming back to Blackpool, the only landlord, he, uh, he, he was from Blackpool, but no family, nobody would take him. He was going into private rented accommodation. Uh, landlord, uh, the only landlord that was taken was one of the, the not so professional landlords. We took him back to his flat. Uh, there was a hole in the ceiling, the plumbing didn't work, and there was mold on the walls. Now he got into recovery in prison uh, from heroin. Uh, he was quite early in his recovery, but he then came out to that accommodation. Guess what, two days later, back taking her in, back offending. And so that sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom level of the security, a place somewhere safe to stay is important. So that stable accommodation is a key part, but we do that, we build the houses, they build the houses they can actually live in, and that's part of our business model and the, and the model. So they can actually work on houses they, they then go and live in. And then well-being and life skills. Um, when, I, when I set up the company, the, the theory in, in health circles was to actually sustain recovery. What you needed was you needed jobs, friends, and houses, homes. Um, and so that's where the title of the, of the company came from. But it quite quickly became apparent um, to me and my team. I'm, I'm the only police officer. I've got a, a team of ex-offenders and people in recovery around me. Um, it quickly became apparent that the, the next fourth key element was actually well-being and life skills. And this is setting up a bank account, setting up a, an email, going to the dentist. We've got nine people doing the driving license at the moment. Uh, how, to, how to go and buy food. Uh, one of the guys, he, he went to the shop, bought a load of uh, stuff, and he, he put it in his cupboard, and it should have gone in the fridge. And then two days later, he had to throw it all away, and he, he, he just didn't realise. Um, so that, that is the four, the four elements, that's the model. It's a simple model, uh, and as a business you, you can have that, but there's a lot of complexity behind it. Um, we obviously we're dealing with complex people, so the actual, a lot of the, the, uh, the subtleties and the, the dynamics how we do it, there's, there's a lot of detail to it. So this is the team, some of the team. Uh, I just want to tell you a few of the stories. Um, so one of the lads there, Terry, he's 43, life parole, been in and out of prison all his life. His mother was a prostitute. He uh, was, grew up with his mother taking clients into the address where he lived. Uh, and he was in and out of care, became a heroin addict at 15, uh, in and out of prison all his life. Uh, he is currently in Corfu on his first ever holiday, being on his first ever plane. Um, and he is our full-time uh, working for us within our tenancy support service. Um, he is he's just doing so well. He, he said, we had a few months ago, we were walking through Blackpool and he said, he said to me, he said, Steve, uh, I've got a Narcotics Anonymous conference coming up on, on a Friday uh, and I'm doing a stand, I'm doing a volunteer on a stand, uh, can, I, uh, can I finish early on the Friday? And I said, well, Terry, you can have the day as annual leave. And he said, uh, and you'll leave, what, what's that? And I said, so I looked at him and I said, well, that's, I'd pay you to have a day off. And he's like, what? And said, yeah, I'd pay you to have a day off. And he said, bloody hell, that's a good idea, isn't it? And then I had to explain to him, well, not only that, but you get 20 of those. And that's the whole, that's the real, and, and it was an amazing conversation to actually have this conversation. He was 43, he never had a job full time in his life, didn't understand about annual leave and actually try to get across him. That is the, the benefit and the point of working. Uh, he's now created a relationship back with his 15-year-old son. Um, and so that intergenerational stuff that we talked about is we, we're starting to really try to impact on that as well. Um, Angus was the most prolific burglar in Blackpool, um, 20 years, got into addiction in his early 14, he got into addiction. Um, 
he said, one of the, Matt, who's my uh, deputy, uh, said to him a few months ago, he said, Angus, what's, uh, how did you pick a house that you wanted to burgle? And he said, he said Matt, I, I didn't pick a house, I picked a street. And he would burgle a street, and he would go in an end terrace, burgle that one up to the loft, knock bricks out, down to the next one, up and down, up and down, up and down. He is, uh, like I said, one of the most prolific. He's, he's now been with us six months. Um, we, part of the, the evaluation to uh, talked about uh, showing how, how it works or not, getting that evidence base, we, we've looked at his timeline and we try to find, he's, so he's been with us over six months now, and we had to try to measure that six months he's been with us, um, and the only intel entry, the only time he's been to police, uh, come to attention to the police in that time was the day he got released from prison, was an intel entry to say Angus is now out of prison and he's with Jobs, Friends and Houses, and then there's nothing else in the six months. Um, and we tried to find, to, to compare it with six months previously in his life where he hadn't been in prison, um, and that was age 14. Um, that we, there was no other six month period in his whole life where he hadn't been in prison. Now, he, we've, had, we've had some real challenges with Angus. Um, he's had his first ever girlfriend, um, and we've had to support him with that because that's been a challenge for him. Um, he came to us with, he was on a 12 milligram uh, script of methadone, and we've actually done his rehab on a building site. He's now abstinent, he's clean. So one of the, we do supervised drugs testing, so they actually have to wee in front of us, so it's not, they just dip it in the toilet bowl and give us a, a sample, so it's supervised. Uh, his abstinence is a key part of the model. Uh, and he's, he's now done his rehab now. Um, currently in Blackpool, uh, NHS are paying 12,000 pounds per person to do rehab. Uh, and he's done that on a building site, and it hasn't, and it cost a lot less money than that. Um, Kelly, Kelly is um, she is was heroin addict, alcoholic. Um, she used to work. She was homeless in Blackpool, um, serious victim of domestic violence as well. She used to live um, in the street doorways, and she tried to save 20p from a begging or from a activity in the day, so she could actually try to sleep in a toilet each night and at least have a bit of uh, security. Um, but otherwise, it, she'd be in a doorway, and she, her self-worth was that low. She was telling me that she used to wake up some mornings um, with Blackpool. Obviously, we have our stag and hen culture, uh, and some of the stag parties would be urinating on her and having lots of fun. But her self-worth was that low that she, she said to me, said, Steve, I actually used to feel quite thankful and grateful because it was warm, and it was actually keeping me warm. Um, now, what's interesting with Kelly as well is... Um, She's at age of six, her mother put her up for adoption, um, but her mother was an alcoholic and a heroin addict as well, and never filled out the paperwork. And so Kerry was, she's always struggled to get uh, confirmation of uh, official documentation and letters and everything, and, and actually it's because she doesn't exist, because who she thinks she is doesn't, uh, doesn't exist in any system, so we've had to actually get her signed an affidavit to actually say that, what her name is and this is who she wants to be known as. Um, I, I, could, I could carry on with stories, but I'm running out of time. But it's just trying to give you a feel that we're dealing with complex people. So when you look at that 41 people that we're currently supporting, 0% reoffending, 0% relapse, don't just think, well, yeah, they're obviously picking the easy ones. The, the only people we don't take uh, are paedophiles, and that's really because of the reputational risk to the organisation at this very early stage in our development. We have got other sex offenders. We've got armed robbers. We've got murderers. We've got people, uh, drug dealers, all those people that uh, have all come to us. Sorry, please don't think that we're, we're picking off the easy ones. So we have three cultures, um, professionalism, craftsmanship, customer service. I haven't got time to go through those, sorry. Um, we have two expectations, what they, what they can expect from us as a management team, but what we expect from them, but what also our customers can expect. Um, and it's just to give you an idea of some of our craftsmanship. Uh, this was an office that we did, renovated for a, a, uh, a medical firm. So that before and after. This is one of the houses that um, we actually, the team renovated uh, and actually live in now. So yeah, again, just to show you the, the quality, this is quality. We cannot be, we are not a cowboy firm. We have got to be the best building firm in the Northwest because 
people, they talk about changing mindsets, people want to throw mud at us because who, who wants to support ex-offenders, druggies, alcoholics? So we have got to be the best of the best and that quality, that professionalism is a key part of, the, of what we offer. Um, and this just gives a, a show of, of some of the work that we do. Okay, we're, so we set up initially as a construction company and obviously that will only uh, be attractive, uh, attractive to some people. Um, so we're now uh, expanding into service employment opportunities. So we've set up a lettings agency. Um, now, but again, it's with a bit of a difference because we've got, now we've got a full-time police officer there. We've got citizen advice. We've got a credit union. We've got a, full, a qualified nurse, um, a counsellor and a wellness service, as well as our own tenancy support workers. Uh, and yet again, I, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm quite confident that is a, a real um, innovative solution to some real issues within the private tenants uh, model. This is um, some of the properties that we're currently that we've renovated and we're we're tenanting out. This uh, we, we have we have lots of celebration. A lot of, we talk about positivity. We we, we sort of 80-20 rule. We we always try to do that. So if there's something negative to say, then you've got to find four positive things as well to say. And we, we always really stress everything's positive. Um, so on on this. We, we have celebration events and we recognise achievements all the time. And this is one of the, the events. The actual uh, Deputy Chief Constable came out to, to deliver these certificates. Um, so on that picture there, we've got, we've got um, a tenancy support worker, we've got an apprentice a plumber, apprentice joiner, and our qualified uh, plumber. Because we also have, we have qualified tradespeople in. We don't sub our work. We have qualified trades to actually come in to mentor our team. Um, and all I'd say with that, who's who? Spot, which one's the, the ex-offender, the prolific ex-offender, and which one's the skilled tradesperson? Um, and when you, you know, I just think it's quite a, a powerful slide, really, because you have, you have one, one in four ch guessing chance, really, isn't it? Okay, just, and I've, I've run out of time, sorry, but some of the other things we do, we, we provide them food every day, healthy food, and that creates other employment. So we have, we've employed somebody to, to do the food. This is the Vice Bureau part of us. Professor David Best is doing our evaluation. He's a leading uh, criminologist from Sheffield Hallam University, just so that we can get our evidence base. We've won awards, social enterprise awards. We provide a pension to the team. So yet again, we're not talking about the next drink or drugs. We're talking about 20, 30 years. We're, that's how far we're looking for them. We're going to be looking at. Uh, this is quite, we got finalists for, this is for a business awards on Friday. I'm really, I'm quite proud of this because this actually shows our business credentials. And this is, uh, it's called the, the Be Inspired in Business Awards for Lancashire, one of the prestigious business awards. So pleased about that. This is a bunkhouse. We bought a 38 bed bunkhouse up in the Lake District, all about their well being and actually taking people up to the, so they can actually get some fresh air in the lakes. Uh, and this is uh, Len Grant who's writing a book. So we've got an ethnographic evaluation as well. So, so we've got the academic evaluation about the sort of the heads and then we've got our ethnographic talk about the hearts of how we've actually done it and writing a book about us. And those are my details. So sorry, John, I know I've right, gone over a bit. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I found that fascinating stuff, and I'm, I'm, we've got uh, a, a few minutes anyway for some questions, so uh, any from the floor, uh, please uh, stick your hands up and our guys with the mics will get to you as quickly as possible. Let me just go back to the beginning and, and talk to Donna first of all, uh, while you're thinking about your questions. Donna, I mean, when you, when you recommend interventions, right, um, give, me a, give me a clue about the sort of criteria you set for an intervention or you, would, you require for an intervention, and also the sort of reaction you get. I mean, uh, is there a danger that in some cases you might stigmatise some families because of your, your intervention, well-meaning intervention? Well, I mean, two different things in terms of how we recommend interventions. So there's a lot of confusion about the evidence of effectiveness of things like family and parenting support. So at EIF, we have a set of evidence standards which are fairly transparent and can, pro can provide um, confidence to commissioners about the security of evidence of impact for a particular scheme that they could um, expect if they were to repl replicate it. And many of the government what work centres have a sort of common set of evidence standards in 
this sort of way so you can sort of compare across them and so on, um, which ranges from things that have um, a good logic model and theory of change but aren't well tested right through to things which would have a number of randomised control type studies um, and the most strongest standards of evidence. Um, in terms of stigmatising families, I think that's... Um, a different question and for me um, all of that is about the skill of the practitioner who builds a relationship with families, understands their needs, can see their strengths and put together a support plan that can help them. Some of the most challenging families have had lives transport, transformed all because of the skill and effectiveness of the individual who works with them so I think yes things can be stigmatising and we need to be careful about labels but there are certainly ways around that. And I was going to say to you, to you Karen, um, I mean, you're, the crime reduction in Scotland, I think you said 41%, was it? Sorry, it's a 41-year low. 41 year, that's 45, I know it's 41 in my head somewhere. 41-year low, okay, sorry, my apologies. Uh, it is nevertheless difficult, is it not, to measure the contribution made to that figure by the sort of work you three do? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the absence of evidence, but you just... I mean, the thing is, we're not measuring whether it works or not. I mean, I know that early intervention works. We're measuring our delivery, to, you know, our ability to deliver it. It's like some of the policing things, you know, I mean, people come up to me and they'll talk about policing things that is well evaluated, we spent loads of money in research. It's actually our ability to deliver it that we're actually doing, and we need to do it on a big scale. You know, and at the end of the day, I know what aspect policing has, you know, we've got, we needed to find the moral high ground for policing, we needed to do things really well, that every time that we had victims that we needed to deal with them properly and make sure that everything was, you know, we had, we could say to others, there's your role, you need to do this now because we're doing this. And it is difficult to disaggregate it, you know, people say, well, how do you know it works? Mm. And I don't, but I feel that I'm, you know, that we've moved in the right direction, that people have got a confidence now, you know, they know that the police are doing their job, they know that education is, you know, is starting to take a bigger role in it, you know, that we've started to reduce exclusions. I mean, Glasgow had a year last year where we never excluded anybody permanently from school. Because one more kid in school is one less kid you have in jail. So everybody's starting to play their part. OK, and do, just finally, we've got a question in the chat. Just one final one for you, Steve. And what's your response to someone who might say, I mean, terrific work you do, very, very impressed by everything you said and the graphics and the illustration of your achievements, etc., etc. But some people might say to you, come on, this is not copper's work, Steve. The, and it's, it's, a, it's a good question because it would not have happened without the police and that is a key part of it because who else trusts or would give ex-offenders, ex-drug addicts, ex-alcoholics a chance and that is the key part. It would not have happened without the police and, and Lancashire Constabulary needs massive credit from so as far as I'm concerned because to actually take the risk and take the chance to actually officially support it, um, it, it would not have happened without the police. Um, and that is the key part of it, because if we can't trust them, who, the, who else in public Apart can? Apart from your wages, what does it, what does it cost the Lancashire Constabulary? That's it. That's it. Right, I've got a question down here. Tell us who you are, please. Stand up if you don't mind. Tell us who you are and pose your question. Nora Holford from Thames Valley Police. You, all of you have spoken that the police service has been very engaged in the different approaches that you've taken. What I'm interested in is how the collaboration has gone with partners, particularly local authorities, who are absolutely fundamental in making each of your initiatives work, particularly in the investment upstream, that early intervention part. OK, who wants to kick that one off? Do you want to go first, Anna? Are you yeah. able to answer that one? I, I can you have can. a go. Um, I think it's incredibly varied. So there are some forces who clearly are driving the case with partners for working differently and are persuading partners in councils and other public services about the need to work differently and are securing resources as a result. There are other forces we talked to who have got aspirations in this sort of territory, but when you say, so where are you with the Director of Children's Services and finance people and health and so on, and they said, oh, well, you know, we're, we're going to go and make a persuasive case, and so clearly there's a lot to be done there. But um, I've certainly seen evidence of the police being able to make the case in a way that has got partners on board that um, stands out in terms of national examples. Why did you ask that question? Have you had negative experiences like that? Yes, in, in Thames Valley we've got the misfortune of having nine separate local authorities where we have to do an early intervention with. Um, some are incredibly forward-thinking, like Bracknell, mm. others 
really only want to invest in the downstream area. And it's a very mixed bag. And it's like you say, you get different levels of engagement and different levels of willingness to, to come forward. And, and do why that. do you think that is? Why are some... Is it budgetary? Is, it, is that the issue? I think some of it's budgetary. I think some of it people aren't as far-sighted and willingness to trust and willingness to try and invest and do things differently. Um, and, and some people really do get that, you know, the areas you talked about, about domestic violence, how that breeds the criminals of the future. And the only way to stop that is to go upstream. So mm. I think it's, it's the ability to kind of see that longer-term vision. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts and questions? Well, just let me pose one more to the two of you. Um, I think it was you, Donna, who said, you know, the, the, there's an argument that the police know where the problems lie, they know where the problem... Am I right? You said that, didn't you? Pro where the problems lie, who the problem families are. Uh, and I would say to you, Karen, I mean, if it's that simple, does it need all the, all the extra effort? I mean, if the, if the police can identify where the problem families are and the probable outcome uh, for, their, for their kids in the future, is all this extra work that effort... Is it, is it that important? Is it, is it that essential? We know, we know who they are, yeah? You can't rely on just the police. I mean, this is... I mean, there's one government... We have huge amounts of money, health visitors. I'm always talking about health visitors. Health visitors will, will go in people's houses, they'll see a whole range of things. They're the first people who'll, who'll see stuff. You need to get it before they're broke, you know? I mean, we're, we're finding them when they're already broken. It's too late. We need to invest upstream. That's why we've talked about it as, as a public health issue. You know, I mean, you talk about partners. Sometimes I think the police are the worst of partners. I mean, and I'm in the police. The amount of times that I see superintendents who are often the key linchpin moving. They move every two years, you know? Nobody stays in a job long enough to, to really see the outcomes of their efforts. You know, so the police have got a massive role, absolutely, and we need to change. The, th the way that we've traditionally done things, you know, isn't fit for the future. You know, we need to change, but it's, it is everybody. I mean, it's health, it's education. The problem is we're set up wrongly, you know? If we thought about the outcomes, we wouldn't be designed the, the way we are now. And it's probably not impacted on you yet, but are you fearful you know, in this climate we're going into now? We'll be talking about this tomorrow, I guess, about, about cutbacks to the service. It's already been cut 25%. It's going to cut two and a half billion pounds out of its budget in England and Wales, not Scotland. Um, it, uh, Further cuts on the way. Are you concerned about your future and the pro for projects like the one you do in, in, in Blackpool? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that, this type of work, the yearly intervention work, could potentially be the first place to, to find some of those cuts. But I would argue, I mean, the very early days of our project shows that, I mean, we saved three and a half million pounds to the taxpayer. If you, if you look at the, the Home Office figures, the 41 people that we are now lo no longer offending. So, I would argue that the work we're doing is... It's cost efficient. Cost efficient, yeah. Ultimately, yeah. Great. Anyone got any more thoughts or questions for our panel? We show your appreciation to our panel. Thank you very much for being here.